This is a download from BFM 89.9, the business station. It's Friday. My name is Jeff Sandu, and on last week's show, MSP looked into some of the tech related accessibility and privacy concerns that have arisen over the course of the past few months. This week, we take a look at how the pandemic and technology are accelerating the changes in the way we work. Something I know you wanted to talk about last week but didn't have the time for, which was office design. So, Matt, shall we start there? Hey, Jeff. Yeah, you know, often we don't pay a lot of attention to the way that offices are designed. So it's clear to many of us, I think, that uh, our employers don't pay much attention to it beyond, you know, cramming desks together and giving people some PowerPoints and lighting and maybe cool them down enough that they don't have an aneurysm while they're working. But for a lot of people, I think, you know, that pretty much describes the environments that they've spent a lot of their working lives in. But at the other end of the spectrum, you have all of these, you know, expensively kitted out offices, design spaces or whatever they call them, that are often much prettier to look at than they are functional to work in. Uh, One of the great exceptions that I've had the opportunity to experience is uh, Nissan's design factory in Tokyo. Uh, That was designed with innovation, utility and comfort in mind because the staff are expected to pass on those same traits in their work for the company in designing the exteriors and interiors of cars. So, you know, it was full of cosy offices that walls could be rolled back and suddenly you're in a warehouse so that the staff could effectively be working next to the full-size prototypes that they were designing. Or by contrast, you know, they could secrete themselves away in mini libraries with the latest design books and journals. And they had all these amazing views over rolling hills and forests. Mm, Which probably doesn't describe the environment uh, most of our listeners have spent their working lives in. Well, exactly. Uh, And, you know, even for the employers that occupy that that middle ground, you know, maybe they've read some of the material about environment, social behaviour or maximising productivity. Um, You know, so they've tried to create a workplace that balances comfort and efficiency but there's still going to be that element of getting bums on seats so what's the best way to accommodate to the the maximum number of people in the smallest space possible without actually compromising their work and that comes down to to money it would be fantastic you know if we all had an acre of land around our desk uh, maybe a couple of grazing sheep uh, an apple tree or two And, you know, it was a 15 minute stroll through the meadows to your interdepartmental meetings. But as we know, companies typically pay rents based on the square footage of the premises that they occupy. So you're far more likely to be apologising to your colleagues 10 times a day for knocking the back of their chair as you walk past them than you are to be chatting about SWOT analysis by a bubbling brook. I feel that we've strayed quite a long way from Generation C and office design realities. Hey, I'm just trying to set a scene here, you know, painting a picture. We've all been staring at our walls for weeks. I'm just, you know, trying to introduce an element of uh, pastoral care into the show. Now, a, a friend of mine who lives in Switzerland amongst the lakes, hills and the bubbling brooks that I've been describing He works for a computer-aided design company. Now, you'd expect the company's cloud services to be very popular right now. Um, People like industrial designers, uh, car makers, architects, of course, engineers. There's no shortage of professions that need remote solutions for 3D design and collaboration tools at the moment. But what I found interesting was that he mentioned that a lot of their clients have been coming to them and asking for help in redesigning their offices. Which brings us back to the new normal. Yeah, because we're seeing, you know, this gradual opening up around COVID-19. People are going back to work around the world. But the offices they're returning to aren't necessarily the offices that they left in mid-March or April. And that takes us back to my friend in Switzerland, because now companies are redesigning their offices around other purposes. Uh, They're asking for assistance to create traffic flows in the office so that employees all move in a a single direction so you don't get people, you know, walking past one another. 
Uh, workspaces are being reconfigured to accommodate social distancing requirements. Uh, and it's the same with meeting rooms and common areas. And they're doing this at a time where they may be experiencing a drop in revenues or payment collections. And of course, while most of them are mid-tenancy with the, the, the properties and the spaces they occupy. Essentially, you have all these financial and practical reasons that prevent companies from simply increasing their footprint. Yeah, and these, you know, effectively spur-of-the-moment requirements are incredibly complex. Um, you know, look at your own or maybe remember back to your old workspace. Uh, how easy would it be to move it to change those PowerPoints and those LAN connections and configurations? to calculate how much space each employee now needs with social distancing. You know, how wide thoroughfares between desks or cubicles now have to be. So these are the kind of things that you need experts, or at least the software of experts, to help you model. And it's not just the physical space. I think one of the things that interested me most was that companies are also asking for help in calculating airflow. They're trying to find out, is the air being cleaned and recycled often enough that it poses a, a minimal infection risk? Uh, they're asking, you know, what are the potential viral loads that an infected employee could breathe out and what infection risk would pose to the rest of their staff given the current airflow levels they have within their space? And surely that's above and beyond for most companies. Sure. But, you know, look at workplaces beyond offices like retail stores. Now, those are often in malls or climate controlled buildings. And also we're in, you know, very uncharted territory legally as well. Uh, I'm sure there will be plenty of test cases in the future, but we haven't legally established these new norms of protections in workplaces and uh, stores and the, the places we go to shop. So it might be covered in some countries or municipalities, but global companies have to think about global practices, not just to minimize interruptions to the actual work, but for the health of the people they employ. So we've already seen plenty of news stories about workers who claim that they've been given insufficient levels of uh, personal protective equipment by their companies. And I think we'll also see challenges that ask white collar companies if they had been doing enough to protect their workers, you know, did they analyze floor space? Did they look at airflow? If they didn't do those things, then why didn't they? You know, where are the limits of liability for companies whose workers contract COVID-19 in the workplace or from colleagues in the workplace? So we are in this very strange new area. We don't know how safe we are at work. And our employers don't know how safe they are from the people they're employing. Which is why you see us accelerating towards automation? Yeah, you know, one of the things we've heard through this crisis is the um, the risk of food ripening and then rotting in fields without a, a labour force to harvest it. So uh, in the UK, for example, there's a scheme called Feed the Nation where furloughed workers can volunteer to, to go and pick berries and vegetables and, you know, whatever else is growing in the fields. Uh, we've seen similar projects in other countries. Uh, in fact, I think a lot of people won't be aware that Jeff volunteers to pick rice every day after he finishes work here in the studio. Uh, I mean, I, I say volunteers, that the farms and the fields are mine and the guards escorting him are armed. But, you know, they've never once had to draw their weapons on him. And yet with employment practices like that, you still want to automate. Well, very often when we see supply side interruptions to goods, they tend to be caused by external factors, uh, war, political instability, collapse of infrastructure, natural disasters. With this disaster, it's very much been people that are the bottlenecks. Um, when you look at something like coal mines, for example, those are largely automated. But unless there are humans to drive the lorries and the trains or workers to load the ships, even clerical people to, to process export paperwork, then that coal just sits in the place that it's mined. So we're seeing these knock-on effects further down the chain related to human activity. But by and large, we haven't seen a shortage of energy. It's quite the opposite. Fossil fuel prices have slumped against falling demand. I, I mean, I'm just trying to use an example that people understand. I mean, I, I guess I should have stuck with food. Uh, the point I was trying to make is that the physical world is largely the same as it was before this disease. It's the humans who are sheltering in place. And that sheltering has had the knock-on effect that 
everything we used to do has stopped uh, or, or at least slowed down, except for the people judged to be in essential industries, you know, people like health workers, restaurant staff, delivery riders. And creative directors? Uh, no, not creative directors. Um, I, I may do a little something on the effects of the pandemic on advertising on our, our spin-off show, MSPX, but I wouldn't make anyone sit through 20 minutes of that here. Uh, what I think most companies have quietly resolved to ensure is that people don't become the weakest link in that supply chain in the future. The shape of automation to come. Stay tuned. You're listening to MSB on BFM 89.9. But films, man. BFM 89.9, the business station. Welcome back. Uh, you're listening to MSP. Before the break, Matt, you were once again unfairly targeting the advertising industry that pays most of your wages. As you sound like a glitching machine, maybe you are the right person to ask what is this new world of automation would look like? Well, I like the way you appeal to uh, my supposed expertise, but then wrap it in an insult. I think you've just invented something called uh, humble ragging. Um, potentially, I guess, the, the flip side of the humble brag. Uh, but one of the stories we covered last year, I think, was an experimental wrapping and boxing machine that uh, Amazon was trialing that could send out orders at a, a, a phenomenal rate. Mm. I remember the machine had to be fed by human workers, even if the orders themselves had been picked up by the robots. Yeah, if I remember rightly, um, because the things we order from sites like uh, Amazon vary massively in size. They're very difficult for a robotic arm to to pick up and sling onto the packing arm. So, robots like things that are orderly. Um, they are getting better at that that fine granular control. But when it isn't automatic and learned, then it is a big issue. You know, you can program the arm to pick up an egg, or you can program it to pick up a chainsaw, and it will use the appropriate amount of force to stop it damaging the item. But if someone orders an egg, a chainsaw, and let's say, I don't know, a vase. What kind of people do you know that order eggs, vases and chainsaws? Well, obviously the eggs are for breakfast um, and the vase and the chainsaw are because you've taken up the new pandemic hobby of extreme flower arranging. But the people aren't the point. The, the point is that people order all kinds of weird and bizarre combinations of things. So a robot that is programmed to pick up specific items struggles when it comes to the realities of human behavior. You know, things we do naturally, uh, our, our flexibility, our adaptability. So you have this weird break in the chain, although it's probably just going to be a temporary one. But you have a machine who that uh, rather a machine that picks the the order, uh, but a person or persons have to sit between the machine who picks and the machine who packs, taking from one and feeding the other. So the joke we made at the time was that humans have become slaves to the machine. You literally have to meet an inhuman standard because the machines can operate tirelessly. 24 hours a day. You know, I genuinely can't remember what point you're trying to make here. Well, the point is that people have been shown up for the weak link that they are, at least from a business perspective, uh, during the past few weeks. That's a bit harsh, isn't it? From a human perspective, yes. But try looking at it from the other side for a minute. Let's say you're Amazon or some other company and you have all these robots fulfilling client requests. Uh, the technology isn't quite up to speed in one area, which is feeding the orders to the packing machine. So you need people. Uh, suddenly a global calamity hits, but you're still OK because your workers are classified as essential. You do worry that uh, some workers are going to get sick. So there is a supply issue. Uh, also, your warehouses, your hubs, they're not optimized to limit the spread of the virus. And your human workers are pretty unhappy with their conditions. Mm. And at the same time, the companies are under enormous pressure to get all of those goods out to the people. Well, precisely. You know, we talked in an earlier show about the pandemic flipping retail around um, because suddenly digital online retail is now the norm. So there has also been enormous pressure from governments for these logistics and shipping and online retail companies to meet consumer demand from everything from the ubiquitous toilet paper to the aforementioned chainsaws. So as a business, do you plan for this as that 
you know, 100 year flood? Or do you assume that this could be the new normal? Uh, You've already been pushing towards automation. Do you carry on progressively or do you double down and phase out that weak link? So it's the same with self-driving vehicles. Do you plan for a future where the delivery truck can break down, but the driver can't? Are we seeing similar moves to automate in agriculture? Well, as I said earlier, you know, one of these scare stories that we've heard is that um, people could end up going hungry because crops can't be harvested. Because the people who harvest that food, who are often foreign or domestic migrant workers, haven't been able to migrate to those places to do those jobs. So we could be looking at farmers losing crops and, of course, the income associated with that and then not being able to plant the the next year's crop. So we have this enormous vested interest in food production being much more machine autonomous than it currently is. So if we go back to those self-driving vehicles, uh, we have um, autonomous agricultural and construction vehicles already coming into service uh, when you see those vast plains of wheat in Australia. Uh, Increasingly, they're being targeted for AI or remote controlled uh, combine harvesters to, to, to harvest that wheat. So you can do a lot of these broad strokes in agriculture with automation already. But it's still difficult to pick some crops with machines. Again, you know, it's that sense of granular control or simply the decision that this fruit is ready, but the one next to it may need another day or two. And then there are issues like uh, weeding. Uh, How does a robot recognise which bit is the weed and which is the crop? So we're seeing increasing innovation in automated agriculture, not least in uh, urban farming solutions where intensive and hydroponic agriculture tended by AI and robots is promising to bring food production back to our population centres and, you know, shorten those farm to table distribution chains that we've seen becoming so critical over the past few weeks. And this is where you talk to us about something interesting like asparagus. Nearly. uh, Cauliflower. An Indian startup called Auto Roboculture in Gandhinagar has come up with a a prototype robot device it calls uh, Nindamani that uses AI to identify and remove weeds in cauliflower feeds. Now, we're not talking about some straw-chewing version of Robocop. They've kept the machine part quite simple. It moves around on wheels between the rows. There's a camera that identifies weeds and a robo claw that pulls them out of the ground. Obviously, the AI is uh, helping it to identify the weeds. The idea is to create a machine that is cost effective for Indian farmers who were already suffering from labor shortages even before this pandemic. So this machine helps to meet that labour shortage and it should help to reduce their dependence on expensive and environmentally questionable chemical weed killers and sprays in the future. Uh, The company will also plan to to incorporate GPS or LiDAR into the machine so that uh, they can be truly autonomous on a farm. And they're also in the, uh, the, the planning stages to expand the crops to other staples like tomato and okra, as well as cash crops like peanuts and cotton. But this is just one of a whole raft of new agricultural automation innovations. What about the world of white collar automation? Well, now that we're all living online, you know, we we mentioned uh, in a show a couple of weeks back that every company is trying to get its e-retail arms up and running. Uh, Those interactions you used to have with brands that you know, just had a basic website operating. Now you go onto those sites and there's some super sophisticated chatbot at the bottom of the page. And it goes to show you how far and how quickly that that technology has come along. Because for basic retail questions, you barely notice that it isn't a human being. And the more we train them, the better they get? Well, to an extent, obviously that depends who supplies your chatbot and probably more importantly, who supports or provides the AI to that company for that chatbot. Uh, It'll be a while before we see how deeply this kind of automation has affected current businesses and whether the always-on robot approach actually increases or maintains sales and, of course, lead generation. Um, But something that I've been doing a lot with clients is, is a little simpler. It's looking at their infrastructure and internal processes, uh, 
looking at all the things that were previously compiled manually and asking, well, you know, can someone just write a script for that and automate it? And it's not even about reducing human headcounts. It's trying to build in those efficiencies and redundancies so that information can flow easily while staff work off-site. But there is an element of will these jobs come back? Sure. Um, Even that example I mentioned before the break, you know, redesigning office traffic flows, those are already tasks that can be automated to a large degree. Uh, You upload a a floor plan, uh, you key in your requirements, and the AI spits out various versions with a percentage correlation uh, that goes back to your original request. And of course, unlike a human designer, you can ask it to keep spitting out different versions and tweaks and permutations. Uh, One of my favorite automation examples um, from the, the, the last few weeks are those UV sterilizing robots that we've seen doing deep cleaning work at hospitals. They're great because it means that a human life isn't put at risk to to clean those areas. But after the pandemic, are you likely to put that robot back in the cupboard and get a human cleaner back? I'd say it's probably very unlikely. And it's a pattern we're seeing repeated across many different industries. Yeah, I mean, China has developed automated restaurant kitchens. We're seeing more drone delivery and drone patrolling services, um, both from flying and rolling drones. Uh, Companies that can automate are running to do so. And the corollary of that is that more money is being poured into startups and cloud solutions that will allow us to automate more tasks that humans routinely do now. So what happens to all those people that technology has made made them jobless now? I said last week that we'd talk about income replacement schemes like universal basic income. uh, And as usual, I've witted on for far too long and blown it. So maybe we'll come back to this again on another show further down the line. But we've seen all sorts of governments floating income replacement schemes during this pandemic. Uh, Interestingly, the the UK has one of the most uh, far-reaching schemes at the moment. But what will really be the issue is what happens when governments try to end those schemes. As I said, the pandemic has shown a lot of companies that it really doesn't make much sense to have human workers, if it's something that a machine can do. And it's no longer just a straight cost benefit issue. It's now a business interruption issue. You don't switch a factory off and come back three months later with your human workforce, switch everything back on and everything just starts working. Uh, At the same time, and You know, this is very simplistic economic analysis, by the way. At the same time, you know, you need people to have an income to buy your products and actually keep that system moving. An income, but not necessarily a job. Well, this is the dilemma. Uh, Can a Great Recession be averted by paying the unemployed not to work? which relies, of course, on governments levying taxes from companies and giving that money to people like you and me to buy the things the companies paying the tax are actually producing. Again, it's a very simplistic economic analysis. Well, you're listening to Matt on MSP, not Roshan on Ringgit and Cents. So in a very literal way, you are getting what you pay for. Um, But, you know, um, universal basic income has had a checkered history in uh, recent pilot schemes. It has tended to improve happiness, but it hasn't necessarily helped people back into the the workforce. Now, there are lots of complex reasons behind that. Uh, But now we have a very different scenario. Uh, We may actually find that companies become increasingly human averse. In that they actively avoid hiring people? Well, yes, which means we're going to need some very creative solutions to put money into people's pockets. It might mean massive expansions of the not-for-profit or government employment sectors. Uh, It might mean expansions in infrastructure and public works projects. We might have to look at things like, you know, charitable and community-based work. Uh, people who actually see volunteering as a career. It could even mean that Netflix pays you to stay at home to watch its worst reality programming. And that's pretty much what most of us are doing already, just without the being paid to do it part. But what I think we aren't going to go back to is this idea of business as usual. I think that whatever happens next, 
we've already entered the the age of the automation nation. While you know we may be living in the new norm, I feel we're still getting the same old Matt Armitage scaring us as usual. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. You've been listening to MSP episode 123. You can download uh, the podcast on the BFM website, or you can uh, also download previous episodes on the app. Uh, you're listening to MSP. My name is Jeff Sander, together with Matt Armitage, BFM 89.9. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To find more great interviews, go to bfm.my or find us on iTunes. BFM 89.9, The Business Station.